afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth and final session of the Public Policy and Institutional Discrimination Discussion Series, where today's topic is lobbying and mass incarceration. For those who may not know me, I am Stephanie Sanders, a Ford School's Diversity Officer and also a lecturer. And for starters, I'd like to just take a few minutes to talk about the goal of the series and also the format of today's event. The goal of the series is to one, create opportunities for engagement. And this gives faculty, staff, and uh, students, of course, an opportunity to get to know faculty uh, and their policy engagement interest and also their research beyond the classroom. A second goal of this series is to foster dialogue on important issues of US public policy, which is why we're here today. Our faculty discussant for today is Mr. Broderick Johnson, who we are excited to join us today. And he will lead today's discussion and he will speak about the topic of lobbying and mass incarceration for the first 30 minutes of today's session. And the last 20 minutes of today's discussion will be reserved for questions and answers. So we hope it to be uh, a very engaging and interactive uh, session today. And during this time, participants are surely invited to make use of the chat box or also use the raise hand feature and wait to be recognized so that you can pose questions directly to uh, Mr. Johnson. And without further ado, I'd like to take this time to introduce uh, Mr. Johnson, who is uh, a Ford School pol Towsley policymaker in residence at the Ford School. Uh, Mr. Johnson has an extensive uh, resume, but I'll try to capture what it, uh, important elements of it uh, for today's purposes. So Mr. Johnson is a public policy and political strategist with more than three decades of leadership at the highest levels of government and the legal profession. He provides strategic leadership advice and counsel to clients on legislative, regulatory, legal, and political issues. Mr. Johnson has the distinction of having been appointed to senior posts under two US presidents. He served as assistant to the president and cabinet secretary under President Barack Obama. And in that role, he was the president's primary liaison to members of the cabinet where he directed a team that helped coordinate policy and communication strategies between the West Wing and federal agencies. President Obama also appointed Mr. Johnson the chairman of the White House's My Brother's Keeper Task Force. So this is an interagency initiative designed to identify and address the disparities that hamper the success of boys and young men of color and to improve the lives of all youth. And in the Clinton White House, Mr. Johnson was the deputy assistant to the president for legislative affairs. Finally, Mr. Johnson has also served on a number of senior positions on Capitol Hill, beginning in the House Office of the Legislative Council, where he drafted such landmark legislation as the Family and Medical Leave Act and the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. So please help me welcome Towsley policymaker and resident, Mr. Broderick Johnson. At this time, uh, Mr. Johnson, you can please share your screen and unmute your microphone. Thank you very much. And Stephanie, you can see my screen, yes? You can see my slide. All right. There we go. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for a very generous introduction and for the opportunity to, to again, uh, be in the presence of Wolverines. I uh, really miss being in Ann Arbor. It's been way too long. I mean, we're all you know, being so affected, of course, by um, this pandemic in so many ways, things that we love to do, people we love to see, but, um, you know, things now certainly are getting better. And I look forward to the opportunity to be in Ann Arbor and on campus, uh, hopefully no later than this fall, at least to come to the big house and to visit the Ford School and the law school as well. And look, I'm delighted that I see some friends, uh, friends of, of, I won't say many years because she might chafe at this, but Cindy Banks, I, I, Cindy Bank, I see you're here and it's great to see you, Cindy. And uh, uh, a lot of love your way. Um, she's a great friend. And I also noticed that uh, there's a, uh, one of my former students from the Ford School uh, uh, course I taught last semester is here uh, as well. So Ben, it's great to see you there. Maybe, maybe others as well. Um, and it's great that, that they're uh, here in, in Ben's case because it means he really looked forward to seeing me and it's not grade dependent that he's here. So it doesn't add to his class participation. Uh, he did very well nonetheless. So again, it's, it's a real honor to be here. And uh, 
uh, on the eve, by the way, of our NCAA or our Big Ten tournament uh, starting tomorrow. So it's all very exciting. And uh, um, I look forward to that as a nice diversion from uh, what otherwise has been a long time, not being able to have the uh, have sports, Michigan sports be uh, something that can um, bring great joy or sometimes disappointment my way. So we're here to talk about mass incarceration and lobbying efforts. And let me uh, let me start here with um, sort of an, an introduction uh, slide. Um, I teach uh, courses here at the Ford School uh, and at the law school from time to time um, that examine the intersection between effective lobbying, that is the tools that are used by lobbyists, the limits that are on lobbying, um, the ethics, those are both legal and moral considerations. Um, how all that intersects with the crisis of mass incarceration uh, in the United States. Um, as you all know, criminal justice reform, especially concerning how we address specifically mass incarceration has become one of the dominant uh, domestic policy issues at both the federal and state levels. Um, it, has, it has emerged somewhat surprisingly, I think, as a, uh, an issue of bipartisan concern. We've been, seen Democrats and Republicans uh, work on these issues as well as independents in ways that is lacking with uh, respect to many other public, public policy issues. One of the key dividing lines though has been uh, drawn over whether or not incremental change is a better strategy for addressing criminal justice reform and mass incarceration versus a more comprehensive approach that would necessitate really ripping out the system from its roots. Um, so this dichotomy, that dynamic is a conflict that continues um, to rage at, rage at the federal level and also at state and local levels. So let's begin with this undeniable thesis. And it, it is a very regrettable one. Uh, and it has presented great challenges and has caused great harm. Uh, the United States by far leads the world in incarcerating its citizens. Mass incarceration has destroyed many lives, um, ripped apart many families and communities, done terrible harm to our economy and further undermine, undermined um, faith in our justice system. Uh, we know there are double and triple standards. Uh, the impact of mass incarceration on individuals and communities of color has been especially uh, pernicious. So we look at these particular critical questions. Um, when did we begin to get here to this system of mass incarceration? You know, what, what are the origins? I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, have read um, the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander's incredible um, book that traces um, mass incarceration um, all the way back, in her view, to the to origins in slavery uh, and the emergence and re-emergence of racial class system as, after racial class system after racial class system, which was further fueled by the so-called war of drugs that began in earnest in this country in the 1970s and accelerated through the 80s and 90s and continued through the beginning of this century and even continues today. And her thesis is that at its core, this system has been driven by race and racial animus. Uh, it's been directed by politicians who have insisted on harsh sentences, like three strikes, uh, three strikes laws and ex excessively long sentences, mandatory minimums, and even death penalties, all very much associated with the so-called war on drugs. Uh, and the, the, many of these politicians over the course of time and through these different racial caste systems have been able to come up with sort of a race neutral approach or race neutral messaging. And yet the results of this system have hardly been uh, race neutral by, by anyone's, uh, I think by anyone's uh, understanding. So we have this uh, also irrefutable fact that hard data cold data tells us the impact of this system, especially with regard to uh, people of color, just to highlight a few things here. And again, these, these are shocking numbers. This is data um, that uh, nevertheless is irrefutable. 
So here we are in the United States, we're home to 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. Our incarceration is four times higher than that of China. In 1980, there were 500,000 people behind bars in, in America, um, half a million people that is in, in 1980. Today, there are 2.2 million people. Uh, and there's been some somewhat of a reduction over the past year, but the numbers are still staggering and well above 2 million. Um, it has quadrupled then since 1980. Um, every year we spend $80 billion to keep people incarcerated at the federal level. Uh, again, put that in perspective, $80 billion. Um, roughly a third of the Justice Department's budget goes toward uh, incarceration uh, of people. Um, and, and in terms of racial disparities, um, African Americans and Latinos make up 30% of our population, but 60% of our incarcerated population. About one in every 35 African American men, one in every 88 Latino men serving time right now. Uh, quite a disparity relative to white men where the number is one in 214. Although it's interestingly enough, that number, that ratio has been increasing. A couple of other things that are not on the slide in terms of the numbers that go again to the disparities. Uh, one million dads are in prison and one out of every nine African-American kids has a father in prison. Again, one million fathers are in prison and one out of every nine African-American kids have a dad in prison. So you have to, you know, even now, especially, you have to say, how did so many political leaders and other leaders, even religious leaders, and many in the African-American community allow this to develop? Um, couldn't they see the handwriting on the wall when they were supporting laws in the 70s and 80s and 90s that toughened tough sentencing, that took away the ability of prosecutors and judges to be somewhat lean, lenient, or at least to better understand circumstances of people uh, that they were indicting or that they were sending to prison. Um, was it naivete? Was it uncaring? Um, sort of heart in the cases of, of many of these leaders? Um, that's certainly one side of the argument uh, that some people uh, project. Uh, I think though it's also important from the standpoint of looking at the reality of what was happening in these communities during these times, especially in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when because of the explosion of crack cocaine and so-called angel dust, uh, we saw um, really we saw violence-fueled uh, drug activity and drug trades in many of these communities of color. And for many of these leaders then, they were so deeply concerned about the impact of drugs and violence in their own communities that they were willing to, to propose and also to support some pretty harsh sentencing, though that has led to, again, mass incarceration that's disproportionately affected uh, communities of color and uh, men of color and African-American men even more specifically. The system of mass incarceration, let's talk a little bit about uh, who has benefited from the system, sadly. Um, but there's no question that there have been beneficiaries of it. Politicians, there are uh, many politicians who, because of being able to exploit uh, the conditions in many communities, especially in many urban communities, have been able to ride political success based on their calls for law and order. And they've been able then to exploit uh, fears about race and class for their own benefit. Uh, for many law enforcement uh, entities, um, as a result of the tools available for mass, uh, for, for incarcerating people, um, they've been able to benefit from the power and resources for purposes of personnel and equipment as a result of this system. Um, communities where prisons are located jobs and economic stability have come to many of those communities and been maintained in many of those communities. Um, and also an, uh, another way to look at this though is that there are many communities, there are many communities in the urban parts of this country that have become more safe, certainly as a result of this massive locking up of people. Um, now there's been of course a tremendous price to pay with say the absence of many men of color in those communities as a result of this, 
there's no question there are communities in this country that are uh, that have been set that are now safer than they were before we saw many of these policies uh, put into place. Um, the private prison industry um, has certainly seen over the last several decades. Uh, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, though, depending on who's in office. But uh, increases in contracts for federal and state procurement uh, agreements, um, and those have certainly, and where those um, contracts have certainly been uh, been put in place, we've seen uh, benefits for their executives, their employees, and their investors. But again, it really can depend largely on which party is uh, is in office. During the Obama years, um, it was certainly tougher for private the private prison industry because. We essentially put a, um, a bar in place with regard to the use of private prisons in many instances, something that was lifted during the Trump years and will be different uh, under the, the Biden administration. Some other industries, I would just point out here, the phone, phone companies are among, some phone companies are among those that have benefited from the system in as much as they've been able to uh, get away with charging really high rates for phone communications between the incarcerated and their families. Families that certainly uh, in many situations could by no means be able to afford being able to communicate that way. And there've been efforts at the FCC to address this, but again, it has been, been a bit of a partisan uh, issue. So this is not to say that, you know, in some of these instances, for example, the communities where people have um, jobs as a result of prisons being in their communities, that there's something evil or nefarious here. Um, it's just to say that there are those communities and those groups that have benefited um, as a result of uh, the system of mass incarceration and the locking up of so many people. I just want to go to those that have been harmed most by mass incarceration. Some of this is quite obvious. When you look at the statistics in terms of the increases in incarceration rates for adults and, and juveniles, certainly what's happened with respect to uh, men of color and women of color um, and the families of those incarcerated, the impact of mass incarceration on children um, is uh, clear and shameful and, and undeniable. Uh, the lasting effects on those children can't be understated, as well as the economic impact of our system of mass, mass incarceration, and the locking up of, of breadwinners, men and women, who would otherwise be in a position to support their families, certainly, um, better than they otherwise um, are able to do without question when they're not just during their incarceration, but even afterwards. One way to think about mass incarceration, by the way, is it's, it also leads to sort of, I'd call it lasting incarceration. The impact of someone being, being incarcerated can of course impact them for their entire lives, whether it have to do with jobs, economic opportunities, um, the, 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 the stature, the, last, the lack of stature, um, all the stigmas that are associated as well. Um, also clearly uh, communities uh, of, especially urban communities where the loss of many people, um, whether it be the, the sons and the husbands uh, and the uncles and the grandfathers and the grandmothers and many other people who are important in those communities and uh, perhaps because of drug related issues um, ended up um, not because they were dealing drugs, but perhaps because they had drug problems, ended up um, no longer being in those communities. And that's had, a, uh, of course, a horrible impact as well. Um, for judges and prosecutors, um, certainly by losing their discretion and their ability to be able to uh, discern um, whether or not someone should face this kind of punishment for what they did versus that kind of punishment or this rehabilitation rather than punishment at all, it's put a tremendous burden on judges and prosecutors, and we have overstaffed prison administrators uh, and, and prison staff as well. Uh, for employers who struggle to try to find, particularly if they're based in urban areas, trying to find employees um, to um, help them run their business successfully. And then finally, taxpayers, the incredible uh, amounts of money the taxpayers see put into a system to lock people up rather than them being in a position of seeing their friends and their neighbors and their community members uh, being able to contribute to, to um, the local economy, but also our national economy. With respect to the issue of uh, who drove mass incarceration, I just wanna make this point. Um, I mentioned the Michelle Alexander book, 
Um, there's another book that I've actually, um, uh, and Ben is aware of this, that I've used in my classes as well, because it gives a different perspective in terms of sort of the, the Michelle Alexander approach or analysis with regard to who drove mass incarceration. Uh, Professor James Foreman has written a book, it's been out for several years called Locking Up Our Own. Uh, it's a book that looks at what happened in Washington DC through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s and, and 90s and really into the turn of the century um, with respect to um, the policies, uh, the police practices, the approach of, of politicians uh, in a city that over time, certainly throughout those decades became a city with, uh, with more black leadership, with dominant black leadership. And yet we've, we saw an incredible rise in incarceration rates during those times. And the title of his book is so suggestive of um, this notion when answering this question of who drove mass incarceration, because um, he points to the fact, again, that many African-American leaders in DC uh, were for policies that have led to mass incarceration, particularly of African-American men uh, in Washington, DC. And so again, going back to what I said before, what, what drove that? Was it naivete? Was it, uh, was it just kind of for political expedience? Um, having been in DC through these periods and knowing some of the people who were involved in, in these policies and these prosecutions, um, thinking about the conditions that, were, that we faced in DC at the time, that led to um, a surge in violence in DC. Um, we became uh, close to the murder capital of, of the country. A lot of that driven by the, the, the impact of crack cocaine and, and other drugs in the nation's capital. And then of course the influx, uh, the tragic influx of guns um, in the nation's capital. All of that contributed to this notion of, of black folks black leaders um, driving mass incarceration and locking up our, our own, so to speak. I would certainly recommend James Foreman's book as well for that analysis, because it does frame then how one should think about what it will take to turn around the system of mass incarceration. Who do we need to appeal to? And what do we need to lead with in terms of uh, kind of the thesis or the theory of the case? What do you have to think about in terms of which leadership you need to turn around on these issues or who you need to be helping to lead these efforts. If you start with sort of a notion that this is also based in, in racism, which in many fundamental ways, of course it is, does it make it tougher to be able to appeal though to certain groups, especially on the right or especially in, in the Republican party or especially perhaps among conservative Democrats in order to make a difference. And then just thinking about the general public and how the general public sees things uh, as well. So that affects, again, how you lobby on these issues and thinking about how you appeal to different people to get involved in it. Is it a moral argument? Is it a legalistic argument? Is it an argument that's based kind of even on um, the, the notion of, uh, of Black folks making sure we are better taking care of our own, uh, of our own um, children and families um, as we address these issues? All this data all the data is what I pointed to earlier is of course very important uh, and data fuels debates and discussions, but it is also so important again from the standpoint of how you effectively lobbying on these issues to think about how you can project individual stories that will move public policymakers and move the general public in terms of how they think about the, the necessity to change things. You know, this is sort of what we refer to in Washington oftentimes when we're talking about a public policy campaign is um, who are the real people here, so to speak, that you can bring into the debate that you can talk about, again, that can convince the public and convince policymakers, convince politicians that they should care about addressing an issue, especially an issue as difficult as this one can be. Uh, and that's, that's very, very tricky because, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to bring a degree of sympathy um, to people who are, who've been incarcerated for, for crimes that, um, Many people would say, you know, kind of like kind of get it, but you really didn't need to do that, did you? Um, and you should pay a price for the for the crimes that you commit. So I want to talk about uh, this a specific example here of something that I've struggled with. This young man in this photograph, um, 
spent uh, five years in uh, federal prison for uh, drug distribution back in the uh, mid to late 90s. Um, he got a mandatory minimum sentence. He had no prior record before he was arrested. Um, he had uh, lived in a homeless shelter throughout high school in, in the District of Columbia with his mom. Um, his mom had had uh, drug related problems and that's how they ended up in, um, in a homeless shelter. Um, he was a student at Howard University uh, when he was arrested, he was a junior at Howard University when he, when he was arrested. Um, uh, I know him personally. Um, this photograph that you see here, which um, is uh, quite compelling to see the president behind, has nothing to do with the photograph. That's kind of the way I guess it must have been taken for purposes of, of this. I must have had it in my, in my office because there's a personal element, strong personal element to the story for me. This young man was a mentee of mine. Um, I met him when he was uh, in the shelter and I was uh, a leader of a program that that reached out to, to young people who lived in homeless shelters to try to help them with their with their educational and social needs. Uh, he was the oldest of the of the kids who were living in that shelter. These this was a big family shelter in Washington, D.C. Um, so I was a mentor to him and he became very close to, to my family, so close my family, the reason he's wearing the tuxedo in this photograph is that this is actually um, at uh, our wedding in 1993. He was uh, one of the one of the ushers at our, our wedding. He was very close to us. Um, if you read the description of what happened to him, um, again, he had never been involved in any drug related crime. In fact, I remember him saying on a number of occasions because of the impact of drugs on on his family life and on his mother that he thought drug dealers should get the death penalty. And so what was shocking then, and I had no idea that um, he would ever do anything that would involve either drug use or drug distribution. So it was shocking when I got the news that he had been arrested and that he was facing a mandatory minimum sentence. Um, he was walking through an airport in Cincinnati and he was profiled and some officers uh, followed him and they suspected him um, of having drugs in, a, in his knapsack. And to make a long story short, he was arrested after he landed back in Washington, DC and they'd gone through, um, through his package back in Cincinnati and the DEA arrested him. Um, he's been out of prison for a number of years now but he was not able to finish getting his degree uh, that he was so close to obtaining and his life has been affected considerably. Now, if you're trying to though project a story of someone for, um, for issues around mass incarceration and the impact of mass in incarceration, this is a story you know you want to be able to tell. But one of the challenges is whether or not this story, for example, having this young man be a witness at a hearing or taking him around on Capitol Hill to uh, meetings with, uh, with members of Congress to talk about the need for uh, for um, sentencing reform, for prison reform, for criminal justice reform? Is this gonna be the story that is gonna draw the kind of empathy you need? Or instead, is it gonna be sort of the story of say, a, a white woman who committed a similar offense um, who was caught carrying um, opioids illegally? Those are some of the, uh, the calculations that you, that you have to make if you're trying to lobby on these issues. Uh, but you would hope that a story as compelling as this young man's story would be able to move public opinion as well. And that's one of the real challenges that we, that we face when we're trying to work on issues as difficult as, as, uh, as the issue of criminal justice reform and mass incarceration. I want to end with something that happened that, uh, during 2017 and 2018 that was, um, was a good story. Uh, some people would say that it wasn't enough. Um, that Congress and the White House, the Trump administration worked together in order to be able to get the First Step Act passed. But there was a debate and a successful debate during 2017 and 2018. The U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate passed the First Step Act and that became law and it's had an impact on thousands of people who are incarcerated and their families. Um, again, some people would say it didn't go nearly enough, that there are lots of issues that have to do with what happens after someone 
has uh, been released from prison and also issues that have to do with preventing people from being in those circumstances in, in, the, in the first place. But we saw this incredible um, uh, army, so to speak, of advocacy groups, both business groups, including even the even Coke Industries that got very involved in the push for, for criminal justice reform. No surprise, prisoner, prisoners' rights groups got very involved. Even many law enforcement organizations um, got involved. Um, civil and human rights groups got involved. Uh, religious organizations, of course, making uh, more, more a moral argument, a religiously based moral argument. And you saw many coalitions of these organizations getting together to work on these issues. And they were successful in being able to move the needle considerably and getting something done that, again, um, took a lot of effort, but um, has had, had a real impact. Uh, and it shows that you know you, you, there are ways to build center right, center left coalitions, business groups working with civil and human rights organizations from time to time uh, and in, on these issues in a very surprising way. There's a lot left to be done after this. And so one of the big questions is what comes next? The Biden administration has made clear it wants to continue to further criminal justice reform along. Um, there are members of both parties who continue certainly talk about the need for it. Uh, we will see though, when you look at the stack of major initiatives, whether it's the passage of the COVID relief bill uh, that will be signed into law uh, tomorrow and you look at infrastructure, which is a major next initiative out of this administration, as well as issues around climate change and the like, where does criminal justice reform rank among the priorities? And at what point can we see really further change, further momentum for more changes on criminal justice reform at the federal level? So the last thing I would say here is perhaps we shouldn't look at the federal level anyway, in terms of where the major changes need to be made. There have been a lot of reform, successful reform efforts done at the state level. And those will continue. Some are driven by state budgets, for example, uh, at least in the minds of some who are pushing for changes at, at the state level because of the impact of mass incarceration on their budgets. Um, and businesses in many states have gotten very involved too around the issues of, of people that are available to uh, supply their workforce. So, and you know, the overwhelming number of people who are incarcerated in this, in this society are incarcerated in state and local institutions as well. So even if um, the, the priorities um, that otherwise exist sort of get in the way of federal changes in the short term anyway, we can look to more changes at the state level and a lot of resources put into that as well. So I'll end with that and I'm glad to entertain any questions that you all have, but that's, a, that's my like 33 minute um, course on criminal justice reform. and. There's a much longer one that I teach. Thank you, Stephanie. Glad to take any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson, for sharing your thoughts on lobbying and mass incarceration and for linking mass incarceration to the historical context of slavery, race neutral uh, laws and policies that you mentioned, as well as providing us with resources on Michelle Alexander's and John James Foreman's analysis of incarceration. Mm -hmm. um, so at this time, I'd like to, for the remainder of the session, I'd like to open it up for discussion. And as a reminder, participants are invited to make use of the chat box or the raise hand feature recognized so that you can pose questions directly to Mr. Johnson. I think there's a uh, question, hand raised there. It looks like Ben Levine's hand is raised. Ben? Oh, yes. Thanks, please. Uh, am I good to just come off mute and speak? Yes. Great. Uh, hello, Professor Johnson. Hey, Ben. You. you too. Uh, um, I'm, I'd love to just learn a little bit more here about like um, efforts or uh, strategies in the legal side too about conditions within conditions inside prisons. So there's, you, know, you kind of mentioned movements, uh, coalitions, efforts to limit mass incarceration or uh, 
the return of of uh, incarcerated people. But what about what's happening inside of jails and prisons? Is that also being addressed? Well, yeah, it certainly has been addressed in some of the legislation, Ben, um, at the federal level, but especially um, at the state level. There have been a number of uh, a number of efforts to address conditions inside of of prisons. Uh, you know that can be very tough, though, to make reforms there because um, sort of a there's kind of a general view that you have to break through, which is that you know people who are incarcerated shouldn't feel that the conditions under which they're incarcerated uh, are comfortable, in a sense, and that 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 um, you know that's a short-sighted view, right? I mean, conditions in prisons should be such that they help lead people toward rehabilitation and successful rehabilitation, which would involve say workforce training, uh, for example. Um, so some, certainly many jurisdictions, I would say that are forward looking, um, address those kinds of reforms. But again, they're somewhat atypical um, in, in many other places as well. You just don't hear a lot of people sort of um, talking about those situations. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Johnson, there's a question in the chat box that I'll read. Sure. Um, so this question is from Julie. So what would your top priority for changing federal policy to re reduce incarceration levels? What would be your top priority? And can you discuss any promising policies that could be persuaded to reduce recidivism beyond workforce training? Yeah, actually, and I think those two are, are um, associated questions um, because you know, a major reason that we have the system of mass incarceration is because of the pernicious nature of, um, of the way we, we fail to give people opportunities and what they need when they get released. Sort of this notion I mentioned of lasting incarceration, right? That you, you know, that you get out of uh, a prison and uh, in many jurisdictions, you, you, if you were in for felony, which is certainly the case with most people, um, that you can't vote. Uh, and, or you can't get public housing. And until very recently, you couldn't get uh, access to a Pell Grant. You could perhaps get a GED, but you couldn't get a Pell Grant um, to allow you to pursue higher education. And then, you know, issues, of course, around employment that have led to, you know, in many jurisdictions efforts to ban the box or among many employers to ban the box as well. So I think that so I, would, I guess I would answer that question that it's really important to look at the back end, like what happens to people after they are released from these from institutions. Important to have training, workforce training and other opportunities from people when they're in, but for people to have support systems and to take away the barriers that not just stigmatize them when they get released um, for the long haul, but also they get in the way of them, again, being able to take care of themselves economically, be able to house themselves and their families in, um, in healthy environments, healthy from both a physical and an emotional standpoint. Um, and then also to be rehabilitated to the point where they can vote and have an impact on what's happening in public policy in their communities. So I think a lot of it really is, again, that back end set of issues. We need to prevent as much as we can people being incarcerated in the first place, but let's stop this, this cycle of recidivism in this country, which feeds this, these numbers so terribly. Stephanie, can I go throw out a question to this group here? This is, Ben knows this, I'll treat this like this is in the classroom. Absolutely. Are people hopeful about the possibility of criminal justice reform being further along? For example, in your state, imagine that most of you, even on the Zoom call, are in the state of Michigan. The people are politicians talking about it there, and are things happening at the legislative level in the state of Michigan? Rod, Cindy. Hey, Cindy. Hiya. Hey, so I, th I think 
I think it's sort of a mixed bag as far as feeling hopeful. I think we've got, especially at the local level, certain things happening like um, our, our local um, uh, Eli Savitt, who is, you know, getting rid of cash bail. And, you know, we're, we're starting to see some things. I think, um, I mean, I, I think at the national level, having this, the administration, as you were talking about before, you know, I mean, it's certainly we've got better chances now, although there was some success last during the last administration, which I'm really glad you touched on that piece too, um, especially talking about the lobbying effort and um, maybe even address more, uh, if you could address even more on not only the state level, because so many of our issues have been state by state, uh, sort of advocacy policies. I mean, you look at the right to life folks who have been going state by state and now we're seeing it in voter suppression. And I'm sure for criminal justice um, that this also is starting at the local and state level and mm -hmm. hopefully eventually moving up to the federal, as well as not always realizing what the perfection is, but realizing that you need to take the steps to get there. Right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting uh, when you think about lobbying tactics, Cindy, uh, around something like this, right? Because, um, I mean, one of the, I think the important successful tactics in any kind of a campaign where you've got people who are working on and successfully made reforms happen on whatever the issue at the state level or who are committed to change on the state level is to have them, you know, sort of intercede um, to lobby at the federal level. You know, if you're gonna move a, a lawmaker, federal lawmaker from the state of Michigan on an issue like mass incarceration, it certainly does help if that lawmaker and his or her staff is being um, approached, uh, is being lobbied by people from the local level mm -hmm. who can say as a result of these measures, right, that we put in place at the state level, we've seen these kinds of reductions in prison populations, in jail populations, in arrests in our jurisdiction. Um, that that is that had a big role to play certainly in what happened in 2017 and 2018, uh, in moving you know lawmakers from pretty conservative states and districts mm -hmm. to a point where they would also support criminal justice reform. And there have been tremendous reforms made in the state of Texas, for example. And you know Texas has been moving more toward perhaps being a purple state sort of, um, <laughs> but still a pretty conservative state. And yet we saw, we certainly saw Texas lawmakers, you know, and federal Texas uh, lawmakers supporting criminal justice reform. Same with Georgia as well, where Congressman Collins, former Congressman Collins, um, worked with Congressman Jeffries from New York on the First Step Act as major champions. Um, a lot of that I'm sure was driven by what was happening in Georgia mm -hmm. that impressed him. Thank you. Sure. That's for that. So Wendy Hawkins. Uh, has her hand up and she has a question for you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Hi. hi. Um, I was actually going to answer, sorry, that's my dog barking, answer a question yeah. about hope in the state of Michigan yeah. around criminal justice reform. Sure. So I think um, what I struggle with a lot as someone who's interested in criminal justice reform and abolition really is that like ending cash bail is really great for people moving forward. But what I want to know is how do we go back and help the people that are still being harmed and incarcerated. And so something that I find myself to be a hopeful person, but something that's hard for me in the state of Michigan is the truth and sentencing laws and how people are forced to serve just indeterminately long sentences. And I wonder if you know any sort of legislative actions or if you find hope in like letting people out after 25 or 30 years because there's so much hope in reducing jail populations or in ending cash bail but then there's yeah. still all these people that have been suffering for so long that are often left out of like legislation and moves towards justice sure so yes there are um many efforts in the states uh on on you know the addressing these indeterminate sentences or these sentences that are so excessive that people just will languish in jail for 30, 40 years. Um, and Ben will recall this um, incredible film that actually showed 
last semester, and I would encourage all of you. Um, it's available, and I think it's still available on Amazon Prime. Uh, but it's a film called simply Time. Um, that's the title of the film, and it's a documentary, um, and it uh, chronicles the twenty-year effort by um, by family, um, husband and wife, husband incarcerated a 45 year sentence for an armed robbery that um, that the two of them committed when they were in their early 20s. Um, she served three years in prison. She was pregnant when she went into prison. They, uh, uh, but he's he had a 45 year sentence and it looked like he was gonna serve all of that sentence. Uh, but she got very involved in efforts to get clemency for him. And I won't, I guess I shouldn't say how the documentary ends, uh, because when I watched the documentary, actually, for the first time, I expected a very different ending. Honestly, I didn't know how it would end. Um, I thought that there'd be some really, because they raised six children, by the way, I can tell you that too. They raised six sons while he was in prison all this time. And several of those sons have now gone on to professional careers. One's a dentist, another one's a lawyer. It's really quite a story. But the most important thing, Wendy, to go to your question is that, that that they have gotten involved uh, in efforts to um, address these indeterminate and excessively long sentences in the state of Louisiana to at least get clemency considerations for many people. Uh, but that's an example of what, what has been happening. And there have certainly been legislative efforts and there's a result of the first step back, people got released from prisons who weren't gonna get released anytime um, before their sentences were over. So. Uh, you're right, though, to pinpoint that there are so many people who spend so much time uh, up to the end of their sentences and their, their lives are over once they end up in prison. Um, and we could so reduce the population by it. But again, without the support on the other side of when people get released, they'll end up, they'll end up in many cases anyway, um, back in prison again, or in many cases homeless, uh, just languishing in, in, in our society. And that's obviously deeply tragic. I think I see a hand raised there. Um, <laughs> hi. I'm not John, though. No. <laughs> I know. I, I said, yeah, I'm sure. What is I'm your name? I'm his wife, Marsha. Hi, um, Marsha. Hi. Um, you asked about hope, and I work out at the women's prison here in Michigan with pregnant women in prison. And we just, the state just decided not to shackle women to their labor and delivery bed a year ago. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, that's a long way from hope to have just that. They don't have, they can have a support person, but only one. Uh, a lot of things that make it difficult and then they have to be returned to prison within 24 hours and not with their baby. After they give birth. Mm. After they give birth. So they have 24 hours, or if the mother has had some sort of birthing problem, like if she had a C-section, she gets to stay an extra day. And um, so it poses enormous hardships. Well, first of all, on the mother who therefore cannot nurse her baby or see that child until God knows when. But sometimes the families live, you know, they might live in the UP and the state doesn't notify them that the woman has gone into labor so somebody can begin to make the drive down. So that child is either in the hospital or goes to foster care until somebody can pick it up. I mean, it's just, it's a very dysfunctional, unhopeful situation. And the reason I bring it up is largely that the organizations who do this kind of work find that if they challenge the system in any way, they can be disinvited to the prison. Mm -hmm. And Massachusetts mm -hmm. did that fairly recently. Did what stopped? Uh, um, Stop the program of having. So what this yeah. is, is it's it, they're uh, doulas who go in. So mm -hmm. women who are trained to be a supportive person mm -hmm. in birth. And this is just because nobody else was allowed to go in with these women. Wow. And uh, so I guess something happened in Massachusetts where the organization challenged the prison system in such a way that 
they said, that's okay, we don't need you in here then. And I think that's a that's a, maybe a hesitation that a lot of well-intentioned nonprofits working with prisoners have. There's a oh, sure. ton of rules, as I'm sure you know, when yeah. you enter a prison. Yeah, uh, no question. You know, this issue about shackling um, pregnant women uh, who are incarcerated was uh, was part of the of the uh, First Step Act at the federal level, anyway, and um, prohibiting that practice anymore, at least at the federal level. So, as barbaric, anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's great when you see progress, but let's not you know uh, delude ourselves that we've got bar barbaric things that um, we have to that just shouldn't. Be, have to be subject to a change in the law that, sh that morality should keep us from ever doing in the first place. But progress is progress. And I, I think that just goes back to sort of, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just nodding my head in agreement. <laughs> and you know, this is something a bit, and Ben can attest to this. This is, you know, as I'd, I'd start off with um, saying that there's the, there's the, this, you know, this bright line, it seems between whether, you know, we need to take a wholesale approach or whether continuing to make incremental change is good mm -hmm. and um you know or enough because you know better is good as my old boss used to say um and yet is that always the case if you've got something that is so fundamentally kind of rotten at the core this goes to michelle alexander's you know approach to this you know, making incremental change, perhaps it makes some people feel a little better and some people on the margins do better. And some lives are changed. These aren't all just about statistics. And yet does it keep us from being able to do something more significant because of all the political capital that is exercised in trying to make incremental change? You know, getting the First Step Act done was not a small thing. And yet could we have gone larger? And among the people who argued for a much bolder approach was, you know, Eric Holder. And if you read James Foreman's book, Eric is pretty is pretty critical of what Eric Holder did when he was U.S. Attorney in D.C. Hmm. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, everyone. We are um, over time. Thanks for uh, for attending today's session. For posing questions to um, Mr. Johnson on the importance of lobbying and mass incarceration, so we can see that there is a lot of tensions between the beneficiaries of uh, who benefits from a system like that and the far-reaching consequences of families and their lives. So uh, this concludes our events. Thank you so much for joining us and stay yeah. tuned 2021-2022 uh, public policy and institutional discrimination discussion series. Oh blue. Oh blue.